Good morning, everyone. Lovely to welcome you to Scarva Street on Sunday, the 27th of June. And we come to our last in our studies in the early chapters in Genesis. Uh, we finish in chapter 22 today. And a little reference uh, to John chapter 8. Our subject is a question, what made Abraham glad? We are taught in at the end of John 8 that Abraham uh, was glad and rejoiced to see the day of Jesus. And in this passage in chapter 22, uh, Abraham is taught by God. We're not uh, told the exact details but with the lamb that is sacrificed instead of Isaac, Abraham learns of the promise of God that in blood he would save his people. And we come to think a little bit on uh, what made Abraham glad today. Friends, just one or two announcements. Um, if you're worshipping with us for the first time, it's lovely to have your company and if you're returning, it's great to have you back with us worshipping on the Lord's Day. Uh, there's no need for um, any members who plan to come to worship here physically in the building over the months of July and August. No need to pre-register. Just simply come along and you can register uh, on the morning. Service will remain over July and August at 11.30 just to avoid any confusion uh, in a change of time. We have prayer meetings. We're able to uh, hold prayer meetings again and they're on the first and third uh, Thursday evenings of the month at 8 o'clock in the Moor Room. So the next two will be, God willing, the 1st and the 15th of July, those two Thursdays, Moor Room at 8 o'clock. I trust to be on holiday from the 1st to the 21st of July. Uh, should you need a minister, though, I trust you'll not. Uh, Reverend Gordon Best is available from the 1st to the 9th of July. And then the Reverend Liam Rutherford from the, 20, from the 10th to the 21st of July. Or you can contact any of the elders and they have the details for both those ministers. Preacher next Sunday in the church building will be Mr. Stephen Johnson. Uh, and I trust, though I'll be off uh, for a while, trust to be conducting online services each week. Um, uh, we begin a study in First Peter over the months of July and August. So I hope that will be an encouragement to those who... Uh, Join with us online. Friends, we come to worship God. We sing that well-known modern piece, King of Kings. And we come to lift up our voices to our Lord and our God.
nations, ransomed souls, brought this sinner near to your throne. All within me cries out in praise, your majesty, I can but bow. Friends, we join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, each time we open the scriptures and we read your word, each time we sing your praise, which reflects something of the glory that you reveal in your word, of who you are and your wondrous eternal purposes. We are reminded that not only are we not autonomous, but we are not alone. You are our creator. You're the one who sustains us day by day. You're the one who speaks to us. You speak in the beauty of the created world. You speak in our conscience and in our relationships. And you speak primarily through your word where you declare in clear language that we can read and seek to understand who you are, what your purposes are, knowledge of your grace and truth. So Lord, Continue to bless us, we pray. We're conscious of our smallness in this world. But that in your heart of unquenchable love, you prize us and we are of infinite value to you because of Jesus. And so, Lord, we come in his precious name. And we approach the throne of grace. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'll be pleased with our worship today. And lifting our voice in song. And taking a humble place at your feet in prayer. And being open and expectant as we hear your word. And Lord, we pray that we'll have Submissive hearts willing to be challenged and changed. And Lord, help us to reflect something of our knowledge of you. Help us to walk in fellowship with you. And help us to know your leading in these days. And Lord, in living out our lives carefully and with the desire to be faithful, Lord, may you be honoured in the lives we return to you. Lord, we pray that you'll forgive us for our sins. Some we know very well, others we just don't even see. But we know that the blood of Jesus covers over all sin. And in that blood they are washed away as if they had never happened. And so in the wonder of your character you can truly delight in us. Because through Jesus our sins are taken away. And in him we have a righteousness that is acceptable to you. So Lord we bless you afresh for Jesus. 
And we ask anew the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, lead us in your way. For his name's sake. Amen. Friends, we find our reading, two readings this morning, just a short reading in Genesis 22, verses 13 and 14. Our subject is what made Abraham glad. Now, gladness is not mentioned here, but it is inherent in the passage because Abraham receives back his son, whom he thought he would lose. And so he rejoices. And so we read these two verses and then a passage in John chapter 8. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Abraham had received back his son, as it were, from death. And yet he speaks in the future, the Lord will provide. Not the Lord has provided, but he's looking to something even more wonderful than the sparing of his own son Isaac. What God had revealed to him would happen. So we turn forward in the scriptures to John chapter 8 and reading from verse 48. This whole chapter, Jesus is reasoning and needing to argue with the Jewish leaders because they are questioning who he is and his authority. And uh, we come to verse 48 and to the end of this chapter, we have an amazing statement about who Jesus is and also what Abraham thought of the one that God had promised. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honour my father and you dishonour me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If a man keeps my word, he will never see death. At this the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if a man keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. The word I am in Hebrew is Yahweh, which is the Lord. The Lord God of heaven. And so Jesus claims to be God. He claims to be before and after Abraham. He claims that Abraham rejoiced in seeing his day. So we think today, what made Abraham glad? 
Boys and girls, we've been thinking about Abraham and his life over the last wee while. And we have our last story about Abraham for now. But the story really is the best story that the world has ever known. It's a story found in the Bible. It's in the Gospel of John and written by a man who knew and loved Jesus so much. And that's the Apostle John. Abraham was very glad, so Jesus said in John chapter 8. And the reason Abraham was very glad was not only because Isaac was spared and he got his son back, but God had told him that he was going to do something very wonderful, that God would send a saviour, the saviour would die, but would rise again. There would be a resurrection from the dead. And that means that everyone who believes in Jesus can have eternal life and live with God forever. So here's the story. It's found in John chapter 20. Mary had gone to the tomb on the first Easter Sunday morning. She was very sad because Jesus had been crucified and buried and she'd hoped to maybe just anoint uh, his body with some sweet smelling spices just to pay her final respects. But when she went to the tomb, she found that the tomb was empty and she was amazed and she went to tell Peter and John. Peter and John had to see for themselves and they both ran to the tomb and they saw the empty clothes and it was true. Jesus was gone. And they went back a bit puzzled as to what had happened. But Mary stayed at the tomb crying. And two angels asked her, why are you crying? She said, they've taken Jesus away and I don't know where they've put him. Then Mary heard another voice in the garden. Mary, why are you crying? Mary thought it was the gardener. So she said, well, have you taken Jesus? Where have you put him? And the person just said, Mary. And that sounded just like Jesus. She dried her eyes and looked up and it really was Jesus. He was alive. Mary was so happy. Jesus was dead, but now he was alive again. And Jesus told her to go and find his friends and tell them the good news. Mary ran to find Jesus' friends. I have seen Jesus. He's alive. And this all happened, as we know, at the very first Easter time. And at Easter especially, but not only at Easter, we remember that Jesus is alive. And boys and girls, that was what made Abraham really glad because God had told him so long ago that God was going to do something wonderful. The Saviour would come and everyone who believes in him would be able to live forevermore. Everyone would have a resurrection one day and everyone who believed in Jesus would be in heaven. Boys and girls, that's the most wonderful story and it's the thing that makes us truly glad because we know God loves us, because he wants us to live with him forever. Boys and girls, we'll have a wee prayer together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all you have told us in the Bible. We thank you for the stories of Abraham way back in the first book of the Bible. And we thank you that you let him know what you were going to do. That you were going to send the Saviour and he would allow people to live forever 
with you, our Father in heaven. And we thank you that that Saviour is Jesus. And when Jesus was on earth, he said that Abraham rejoiced at the thought of Jesus coming and all he would do. We pray too, Lord, that you'll help us to be glad, glad deep down in our hearts, because Jesus has come and lived and died and he's risen again. And through our faith in him, we know that we will be with God forever. Lord, help us just to think of these things and quietly in our hearts be really, really glad. Hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake. Boys and girls, we'll have a story for you next week. See you then. Friends, as we come to pray for others today, we come to think of little church families around God's world. Um, every Christian is precious in God's sight. And we think today of... Uh, Two church families in Kenya, Gary and Mary Reed, two of our missionaries work there. And they work with these two church families in Alkanaya and Siana. They ask that these congregations will be guided by God. And that also many more in uh, Maasai land uh, will come to know Jesus as their saviour among the Maasai people in Kenya. As we think of them, we think of other church families around God's world, some uh, poor, some remote from other Christian fellowship, some without uh, the, the ability to have a, a good Bible teacher or, or leader uh, struggling. Uh, let's ask God, and knowing his heart, that desire to be gracious and blessed. Little verse in the book of James, you do not have because you do not ask. And sometimes we forget the very simple thing of just asking God humbly. Let's come to pray. Let us pray. Our Father, we think of our own church family, wherever that is. We picture people we know well. And we remember in this time of lockdown and pandemic that we're not able to meet and minister and uh, simply share one another's company as we once did. And Lord, we know the, the distancing that that has brought to us and just our lack of ability to, to support and to encourage and to fellowship. And yet, Lord, you've sustained us and you've helped us. And so today we pray for those who are very remote in their setting from other Christian groups. We think of these two church families, Nalkanaya and Siana in Kenya. We pray for Gary and Mary as they help there, as they encourage these church families. Lord, we pray for growth in faith, uh, an ability to reach out, a calling of others to come to know Jesus. And throughout the whole Maasai land, that there'll be a move of your spirit to draw and point people to Jesus. Lord, we think too of other countries where there are similar situations. We think of those who are isolated, those perhaps belonging to a country where there is a very small Christian population. 
Some of your people, O oh God, are oppressed greatly. And we pray for our brothers and sisters. We pray, O oh Lord, for that breath of your spirit throughout your world. That you'll touch the hearts of men and women and children. That you'll give cause to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, O oh God, that by your word, touching mind and heart, that eyes will be opened to, to spiritually see, to understand the great need because of sin and the, the all-embracing Saviour who is Jesus, to forgive and to keep and to rejoice in his people. Lord, hear our prayer. Be with those who are sick and troubled today. Those with particular needs, perhaps known only to themselves. Those fearful and anxious. And Lord, even as we pray, perhaps picturing one or two people in our mind's eye. But so many others we do not know. Even as we pray, Lord, come by your Spirit and answer our prayers in your will and bring blessing to those in need. Lord, around your word, be our teacher, we pray, and to you be the praise and the honour. Amen. Leah is going to lead us in a solo, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
gracious Savior of my ruined life, my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders. In my place, you suffered, bled, and died. You. Friends, we ask the question, what made Abraham glad in this very powerful chapter in John 8, Jesus in discourse with the Jewish leaders uh, shows his strength of character and purpose. He declares not only their error, but he declares afresh who he is. He is the I am, the Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the one who was before Abraham and is after him, the one to whom Abraham looked forward to and rejoiced to see his day. It was a direct challenge to the Jewish leaders. Abraham is our father. And yet Jesus says, I am Abraham's God, and I am your God. And as Abraham rejoiced to see my day, so you should be glad that I am here. But what was it that Abraham saw? And what was it that made him glad? He saw the way of salvation. And in what we might describe as a, a, an acted out parable, though a very painful experience for Abraham, for God had asked him to do something unspeakable to take his only son and to sacrifice him to the Lord. Now, Abraham had known God's faithfulness down through the years, he had waited 30 years for Isaac to be born, and God was faithful. Isaac was 14 or 15, so he'd watched his young son grow up. He was his pride and joy. He was the fulfillment of the promise, and through Isaac's line, God would bring a redeemer, and he would bless the nations. And so when God called Abraham to sacrifice his son, not only was it an abhorrent thing, but it was something that didn't make sense. How could God keep his promise if Isaac was dead? And yet Abraham trusts. Perhaps he was able to go through those three days in preparation before they reached Mount Moriah. Perhaps it was just so heavy in his heart. What is God teaching me? What is he doing? What, what is going to happen? In our study last time in uh, Genesis 22, we reflected on into Hebrews 11, where Abraham believed that God could even raise the dead. That if Isaac suffered physical death, God could bring him back to life again. And he reasoned this. But what happened was that when the knife was lifted to slay his son, in full obedience to God, the voice spoke from heaven, do not harm the boy, do not lay a hand on him. 
Abraham saw the cost of salvation because he was called, Abraham, he was called to give his only son. And God was teaching him, your son will be spared, but my son will not. In Second Chronicles 3, verse 1, when Solomon began to build the temple at God's command, it was built on Mount Moriah. Here, when Abraham and Isaac were there, it was a barren place, just a, a bare mountain. But it was to become Jerusalem. And on that mountain, as Abraham says, it will be provided. Abraham saw something of the cost of salvation. It would cost the only son, the only son of God. God would provide on the mountain. He not only saw the cost of salvation, but he saw surely the way of salvation. The way is by substitute, one dying in place of another. His son was spared, but God's son would not be spared. And not only for Isaac's sake, but for the sake of all of God's people. Those in the Old Testament looking forward to the coming of the Redeemer. And those in the New Testament and beyond looking back to the Jesus who had come. And so the faithful in Old and New Testaments and in the Gospel era would be one family. As Jesus teaches in John 10, there's one shepherd and there will be one fold in the end. Not a Jew and a Gentile one, but one centered on Jesus and saved through him by his blood sacrifice on the cross. So Abraham saw the cost of salvation, the giving of God's own son. He saw the way of salvation. That one could take the place of another. The innocent for the guilty. That the guilty might go free. He also saw the glory of salvation. Because where there was death, life would come. Dead in sin, but alive. In Christ, eternally separated from God, but eternally brought near. Sin, which leads to death, would be reversed because sin would be paid for. And because this is God's working and God's kingdom, and that which is everlasting, the life that is received is of eternal value, an eternal existence with God. Abraham saw these things, what salvation would cost the Lord, how salvation would be brought by the Lord, and the glory that God would share with his people in the granting of eternal life. And throughout the scriptures, God gives us little pictures of this promise, this promise of eternal life. Job in chapter 19 says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in my flesh I will see God. In Psalm 16, at verse 10, David has this revealed to him that God will not let his Holy One see decay. The Holy One would die but would not see decay because he would be brought back to life again. Now, of course, God cannot die. But when the Son of God, the Eternal Son, came to earth, he was 
God in all his fullness, but yet he also took upon himself our humanity. And so when Jesus died on the cross, to be carefully accurate as to what happened, God did not die because God cannot die. But on that cross, Jesus gave his human life. He died as a man. Returning to God when he breathed his last. But then returning to that body on the resurrection morning. Entering into it again and bringing that humanity by the power of the Spirit to life again. The same, yet gloriously transformed. As we read of Jesus post-resurrection as appearing and disappearing. Coming into a room without going through a door. Yet taking a piece of fish and eating it. Solid. Substantial. But a body with new properties not curtailed by present time and space experience. It lets us see something of the glory of eternity, of, of heaven. We live in time and space. God is outside time and space. He is the Yahweh, the great I am. Literally, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. God simply is. So time and space do not confine him. It's like a, a bubble that we are inside, but God is outside it all. And in his kingdom, it is outside time and space. And so the bodies we will possess at the resurrection will be the same, yet glorified. The same, yet incorruptible. The same, but with additional property not confined by our present physical world that God has created. But of course, when Jesus rose from the dead, there was great joy when they realized that he was alive. In John chapter 20, verse 20, we can read of that Great joy, Jesus appears in the upper room the first Easter Sunday. Thomas is not there, the, one of the disciples. The next, uh, uh, Easter, uh, next Sunday he, he appears again in the upper room and Thomas is there and the disciples rejoice. They are glad, reflecting something of the gladness of Abraham long before. For they too had begun to see and understand and take it in. The cost of salvation. It cost God his son. His most precious possession. The way of salvation. The son of God living and then dying for his people being their substitute, taking their sins and dealing with them. And the glory of salvation, something that would not be reversed, something that would never end, an eternal life. God did this because he loves us. He paid the cost. He did this because it was the only way a perfect man had to be substituted for sinful man. And yet that perfect man needed to be of infinite value. And so it was God's son himself. And God wanting to share his glory with us, not only for a time, but for eternity. The cost, the way, 
the glory of salvation. And just as the disciples rejoiced when they saw Jesus alive, so we too are to rejoice. And how do we do that? I suppose we can think of how God has made us. We have minds, and in our minds, God allows us to take truth in and to think upon it and and to rejoice in it. With our minds, we remember the cost and the way and the glory of salvation. We remember the unspeakable love of God for us. And how all through Jesus' life, especially that last week on earth, and through the beating and through the cross and the separation from his Father, the enormity of God's love for sinful men, women, and children. And in our minds to remember the effectiveness of this. It is God's doing. God's Son is paying the price. The only one able to do that. And the only one willing to do it. And the glory. That every moment on earth. God watches over his people. And he will bring them in the end. To their final abode. Heaven itself. And so we rejoice in our minds. We rejoice in our hearts. We rejoice in this wondrous love of God. And surely we want to love him back more and more. The more we understand and experience these things. God thinks of you and me more than we think of him. Isn't that amazing? God cannot love you as a Christian any less. And he can't love you any more. Because his love is perfect. It's unchanging. And he allows us to experience more of that love as we yield ourselves to him. And in our hearts... We want to love him back. How often do we just sit in God's presence and say, I love you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Sounds very childlike. But isn't that a good thing? If he is our heavenly father and Jesus is our brother, it's all right to be childlike. And what about deep in the soul? To rejoice that all is well with the soul because of what Jesus has done. I suppose we're always tempted to look inward regarding salvation. Yes, Jesus has won it, but There must be something there that means I could lose this. Some fault of mine, some mistake, some indifference in the future, some turning my back on God. And those thoughts can predominate our experience. But when we look away from ourselves and look up to the Lord, Who has power to undermine the work of his cross? Who has power to diminish his love for his people? Who has power to make God bereft of the children he has saved and and take them from him? God will not let one slip from his grasp. God will not let one fall out of the clutches of his hand. 
he will ever keep his people. And deep in the soul, he wants us to know that and be glad. Abraham was glad. For he saw something of what God was going to do. The disciples were glad. They saw Jesus alive again in their presence. We too can be glad. Because we have all this knowledge revealed in the scriptures. And in our own heart experience as we surrender to him and know that un that enfolding of his arms around us we too rejoice and are glad Let's pray together. Father, we bless you for how your word beginning to end is an ever-revealing story of your grace and love. Even in our thinking today, through Abraham, and through Job, and through David, and through the disciples, that thread of faithful revelation of God, right to the present day as your word bears witness to these things in the hearts of your people. We thank you for the cost of salvation, the way of salvation, the glory of salvation. And we thank you that in the mind we can rejoice, in the heart we can rejoice, and deep in the soul we can rejoice. And Lord, let these marks upon the real person, the the person within us be exhibited in how we live and speak. The things we hold dear, the things we delight to do. Then all these things, Lord, will you be pleased to honour yourself in the lives of your people. Hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Our closing praise is uh, set to an Irish melody. It's entitled, I Cannot Tell. We do not know exactly what God will do to bring the nations to himself. But we know that one day people from every tribe and tongue will gather before his throne and he will be honoured. And so we sing in faith and yet in expectancy because God is faithful.
join together in prayer. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.